What's going on, guys? Coach Matt and YouGoProBaseball.com here with Brent Porcio, Top Velocity, and we're going to talk about PAP, what he calls PAP. And uh, there was a video you did a while ago where you and another guy were doing some power cleans. Um, you threw first off the mound, did some power cleans, got back up there, and you gained six miles an hour instantly. I think the other guy gained four, four miles an hour. Miles. Why and what is PAP? Take us through it. All right, so this is going to be our before uh, throws. So we're going to do some before throws. You can see on the gun, and then we're going to do some after throws after we do uh, our, the, the cleans uh, with the heavy loads. Here we go. Now get our Olympic clean with the heavy load. We want to go something 75, 80 percent. This is uh, haven't maxed in a while. I'm getting old, right? But this is close for me. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna hit. I'm not gonna do too much. I don't want to fatigue myself. So I want to hit about. I'm gonna do about three of them if I can. Here we go. If I can, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're on. Good form. The explosive. Good. Racket. How many do you need? Come on, get explosive, take it to the mound. Nice. Move that arm. All right, so pretty cool. So PAP is post-activation potentiation. And what it means is, think of your body like a Christmas tree. When you go out to say throw for the day, your first pitch, you're turning your muscles on, but you're only turning on a little bit of the lights on the Christmas tree. PAP, post-activation potentiation, is the potential to let's turn them all on so then when I get on the mound, it's like I've been throwing for four innings and my body's live and ready to go and moving at a high rate of power, power production, basically. So we're trying to turn the whole Christmas tree on. And when you take a, like a lift, like a, a power clean, because it's a total body lift, so we can activate every muscle in the body, and you go at an 80%, at least 80% of your one rep max, where studies show we maximize power, it's been shown to turn on all your motor units or turn your Christmas tree on and light it up, and you only need a few reps, and then you get on the mound, and it's like you've been throwing for 40, and your body's at an optimal level of, of power and muscle activity, and, 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 and it works. And it works, too, in a long term. If you, if you train that way, it's a great way to train. It just helps you constantly be... Uh, in full muscle activity to and forcing your body to enhance that and adapt over time and it works so and you're a usa uh, certified weightlifting coach one of the things that you talk about is triple extension on these lifts right same thing in your pitching program triple extension is huge so obviously if you can get the movements and the power through your body this way it's going to translate very well to on the mound especially over the long term that obviously that video showed an instant reaction yeah. but if you continue this over the long term you're going to see some Thanks, really really great results take us through uh some of the stuff so like we're talking about triple extension triple extension is extension of the ankle knee and hip flexor that's how you maximize power in your lower half big part in say olympic lifting because that's how we jump and drive the weight up if you're doing it through a triple extension approach um, that's going to maximize ground force which potentially that's why you can throw harder on the mound because you're bringing more energy up your body. As long as you separate, you can transfer that to the ball. So <laughs> why are we using training in a weight room? It's because of these weights. It, I can't really put up to, like you said, 80% of your one rep max or like we tell our guys that are around six feet tall or, or above to get to 130% of your body weight on your one rep max or 
If you're lower than six feet, we are going to push you up to 150% of, of your body weight. We can do that in a weight room with the weights to load the body to force the body to adapt. It's really hard to do that on the mound. If I could take 130% of my body weight and put it on my body and go through my pitching delivery, I'd, I would do it. <laughs> I mean, that's the definition of sports specificity, but it, it's just too hard to do that. So we do it in a weight room and then we have to train through the skill for us to move it differently than we did here on the mound. Um, so I mean, you want me to go through like just technique and stuff? Sure. All right, so some simple technique when we grip the bar, and, and you know, this is important. Supervision is what keeps the injury rates very low in Olympic lifting. Like, if we look at a six year study, 3.3 injuries per 1,000 hours on elite Olympic lifters was the injury rate. And on Major League Baseball study for six years, 3.6 injuries per 1,000 hours. So, technically, it's safer to be an Olympic lifter than it is to be a Major League Baseball player. But that means you're an Olympic lifter, you know technique. And a lot of the studies that show the low injury rates for Olympic lifting are supervised. So it has to be in supervision because a lot of times I see guys doing power cleans and that's really an arm curl. You know, it's an upper row into an arm curl. It's not a power clean. So basic technique we'll start with is how you grip the bar. We got to balance out the bar so we're not off balance. So we do these thumb grips. This is the knurl. This is where the grip starts. You want to put your thumb in there, extend your thumb. And then we have to wrap the bar, because that's, once again, it secures the bar so it doesn't fly out of hand. And at this point, you can either do a, a regular grip, or you can do a hook grip, which is a uh, thumb to index finger. That, once again, it secures the bar even more. So once we do this, we're in a good, secured position. The biggest challenge in, the, in Olympic lifting is the rack position. A lot of baseball players find out they don't have a lot of mobility or strength to do the rack position. But... In this approach, we don't like to handicap athletes, meaning we don't want to like say, okay, well, then you shouldn't do this. We want to say, okay, well, that's a problem for you that won't just be expressed in this lift. It'll actually be expressed in the mound. Having more strength and mobility will keep you healthier on the mound. So we're going to help you get better. So then when you can get up here and you want to rack, it's easier for you to do. So it just means these are like training wheels, guys. If you can't do your front rack position, you're going to have to just practice, practice, and, and until you can take your training wheels off, and then you go to town off of it, on it. So the keys to the rack position, I like to start one at a time, is you, once you got the thumb gripped, you're going to throw the elbow. Let's go one, like I said, one at a time, let's throw the elbow inside the hand. We don't want to go outside the hand, because then I'm more in flexion and it fries my wrist. I want to go elbow inside hand as I place the bar under my, my uh, clavicle or collarbone. Okay, the bar, and then I want the humerus to be uh, parallel to the floor because the bar is going to rest on that upper trunk. Ideally, the arm is just in position to guide the bar up and down uh, from the floor. So you can practice one at a time. Take the, the shoulder inside hand and take the elbow inside hand as well and, and keep this flush your chest and find, try to find that, that good shelf to create that rack position. You can do it both ways. Okay, and then once you get that, then you go both together. Just got the mic here. <laughs> got to go both together like this, okay? I'm in two fingers because it's easier for me with two fingers than four. I don't, I don't have that great of mobility here either. But I've gotten to a point where when I get there, I can take my hands out and I'm racking the bar. If you're a guy who's struggling with the rack position, you more than likely have some lat tightness to get your elbow up. You've got some rhomboid or mid-trap tightness to bring your elbows in, and it won't let your scaps protract, which, once again, that's not going to help you as a baseball player. We've got to work on that. Um, and it might be an upper uh, back strength issue. A lot of kids will go there, and they'll just start dropping the weight because their upper back can't hold themselves up. Once again, that means you have upper thoracic weakness, which is going to not help you on the mound. So just things that we have to get better at before we can really get good at the Olympic lifts. From there, we, we can take it to the floor. So on the floor, we want to get as close to the bar as we can. So th the goal is to keep the bar path going straight up as we move the bar, because if it goes forward, then it's gonna be harder for me to catch and rack the bar. So we wanna keep the bar as close to our body 
so we can move it straight up our bodies and then get under it and rack the bar. And what I like to do is first when teaching all the steps to the clean, and we're going to go just through a power clean, is I like to teach the start position first, and then I'm going to give you three phases that we go through to complete the lift. Uh, or actually, we'll make it a fourth phase too, which is where you rack. So the start position. You go from a shoulder width position to a hip width position. All right, in a hip width position, it's a better position to jump. A shoulder width position is where we squat. That's not a great position to jump because your knees still want to come together. So this is a jumping lift. So we want to be hip width position. From here, I want the feet about halfway into the bar. I'm going to squat down to the bar and get my hands set up to start the lift. So a good squat is good posture. So squeeze your butt, get your hips under you, squeeze your stomach to, to line your spine and create some spilly, and then take your femurs and turn them out and create good torsion in your femurs because that creates stability. When we go this way, that's instability. That is, creates more stability. From there, I'm going to hinge at the hip, down to the bar, and I'll pull the bar out just to get uh, my, my grip set. Then I go thumb grip, then I want to wrap my thumb, okay, and I want to roll into my palms, meaning I'm going to start pulling this bar, and I don't want to pull it through my fingers. I want to, after I wrap the, the bar, I want to roll it into my palms so I can pull into my palms. Then from there, I'm going to take, this is to get start, I'm going to take my butt just above knee height, only just above, not high, just above knee height, and I'm going to bring the bar back into my shin, and I'm going to keep the arm rolled forward, and now I'm going to focus on where my trunk is. If this is my bar path, I only want just my chin over my bar path. I don't want my trunk over my bar path because my bar is going to go that way, and I'm never going to catch it. I want only my chin over my bar path. And there's my start position. I have a lot of tension in my legs and my arms as I'm pushing my elbows into my knees. My chin is on my bar path. My spine and core is really tight as I pull my trunk up. And my butt's just above knee height. Okay? Just practice your start position. Practicing your start position is a challenge itself. It takes a while to get into a good start position. And just like on the mound, pitching, or hitting or taking a lead on the base, if you don't get a good start position, you're, it's going to compromise how well you move through the skill. Once you got your start position, we're going to break it up into the three first phases before the catch. The first phase is the lift, the second phase is what's called the transition, and then the third phase is triple extension. And we build energy th through this movement the same way as you do on the mound through stages of a rocket. You start off slow, and as you move through each phase, you start to pick up your speed to your maximum speed. Okay, so the lift out of your start position is moving the butt and the hip up at the same rate. So lifting it up together at the same rate, right there. And if you're just learning it through these phases, you can do the first phase and pause at the knee. So first phase, pause, all right, I did it right. If I did it wrong, my butt goes up, then my trunk goes up, that's wrong. I'm gonna go butt and trunk together or shoulders together, pause. Here's the transition, it's the hardest phase and I'm gonna do it sideways for you. It's where the knees stay flexed and shift forward, okay? A lot of guys do it wrong and they just stand up. Now I got nothing to jump with. This is where your knees shift forward and your trunk goes upright, see? Knees shift forward, trunk goes all right. I'm still flexed, okay? And the bar is coming up your thigh, okay? That's the transition. So if you went through it, it's lift, pause, transition, pause, then the final phase, triple extension. And that's basically a jump, shrug, all right? So you just jump, shrug. Now, if you have light weight, yeah, you're gonna come off the ground. But when you start doing heavy weight, you're not coming off the ground. So let's go through each phase, and this is a good way to practice it. Lift, pause, transition, pause, triple extension, a little shrug at the end to add the power. Final phase is when we go into the rack position. Somebody grab me a dowel down there. So when you go to the rack position, you want to, you're going to be in your hip width position, and this is when you catch the bar. What we're going to do is, from your hip width position, I'm using this just because I got a mic on. I'm going to mess the mic up. 
when the hip width position, when I go through triple extension, the bar is going to go weightless because with my thighs under the bar, when I drive, it pushes force under the bar and the bar projects up and it feels weightless in my arms because my arms aren't pulling. And that's when you know you're doing it wrong. If you're bending your elbows, you're pulling with your arms. There's an old saying, when your elbows bend, your power ends because you're pulling and shutting your legs off. Doesn't work that way. You jump, it thrusts under the bar, the bar goes weightless, and all you need to do is take your feet from a hip width position to a shoulder width position and drop your butt to receive the bar. If you go past shoulder width, you're cheating and trying to get under the bar and you're not driving your bar high enough. So hip width, shoulder width, slap your feet, drop your butt, and at that point, you're just gonna throw your elbows up and under the bar into your rack position and receive the bar. So it looks like this. Lift, transition, triple extension, and rack, all right? And that's the power clean. I know it's hard. Studies show the time you take, this could take three weeks, four weeks to good at, get good at, the time you take learning this still gives you benefits and improvements that you will see on the mound so just because it's hard for you to learn doesn't mean you're not getting better. And then when you learn it, then it's about how much power you can build above your body weight. And that's when you really start to see enhancements in what studies show in all the dynamic movements, jumping, running, throwing, this enhances those movements. Very nice, very nice. Um, I have some experience with Olympic lifting. We did them my two years that I was at Auburn University. Um, one thing, if I remember correctly, it's been many years now, but I think we, they had us a little bit wider. Is the grip distance, is well, that? When you're getting to a snatch. So there's, there's two lifts in the Olympic uh, sport, clean and jerk and then snatch. So the clean and jerks are close grips, the snatches are wide grips, gotcha. which I don't, I don't teach the snatch to the younger kids because you need good shoulder strength. Studies show Throwing athletes, specifically pitchers, have weaker shoulders, throwing shoulders, than the average public. And they have weaker shoulders than position players. So, unfortunately, the act of throwing a lot actually weakens the arm. So, you don't have great shoulder strength. Plus, if you're doing this while you're throwing, it makes your shoulders even weaker. So, I, I, I typically avoid the snatches unless you become an elite lifter, and then we'll, we can go into it. Gotcha. And one other thing I want to add about my experience with them is... We did it with just the bar for a very long time. Yeah. Like, like you were saying, three to four weeks, we were basically working the bar, working the technique. So this is something, even though we talked about in the beginning of the video, adding instant mile per hour, this is something you want to seek out. Brent or someone like Brent, you got people across the country mm -hmm. who do your training. Or um, any USA weightlifting certified coach. There, you can search for them through teamusa.org. They're all over the country. And once you get the, the fundamentals down, then you can kind of work off of your program and, and really build that long-term uh, power. But, and, but look at it this way. Yeah, doing simple stuff like squatting, um, you know, upper, upper body pressing, you know, uh, trap bar deadlifting, those things do improve performance. But this is a complex enhancer of power, strength, and speed through a complex movement which studies show transfer better to complex skills because pitching is such a complex movement and a complex skill of, uh, uh, you know, lifts or training that loads and enhances the body through a similar complex movement transfers well the gains to another complex skill. So I'm not saying ignore all these other things. It's just a great tool because it's such a complex uh, a lift and it, and it transitions well to a complex skill, basically. Makes sense. Now, what do you say to those people who oppose uh, uh, Olympic lifting, that throwing athletes shouldn't be putting their wrists and their elbows and shoulders into these uh, vulnerable positions? Uh, how do you oppose It's that? a good one. So we get that a lot. Um, is the pitching is already putting a, a massive valgus load on your arm, stress on the, on the UCL. This will never get close to that load. And if your body isn't strong, timing the movements right, stabilizing the core right, you're gonna wind up in injury. There's a good chance you'll have injury because there's, there's a pattern of injury in baseball in the, in the arm for pitchers. There's no pattern of injury here. But th what this is saying is 
we're in a controlled environment. If the weight's too heavy, we're going to lower the weight. We're going to get your body, help your body adapt to handle this, the stress of this training to where you will be in a better position mobility-wise, strength-wise, uh, you know, motor control-wise to survive uh, the, the challenges of pitching healthy, which is, like I said, is very hard to do because of the pattern of injury. So we're in a controlled environment, putting our body in highly mobile, uh, you know, explosive, strong positions and make it, you know, if it's too much one day, we'll bring it down and we're building the body to be able to survive the stress um, of pitching at a higher level. Like, you know, for example, people want to relate throwing as, you know, as, as a better way to condition the athlete. The problem is, like I said, you're in a movement where you're putting, you know, they say up to 80 miles an hour is enough to tear the UCL. You're never going to put yourself in that position, even though this feels really, you know, I feel weak and I feel uncomfortable here. It's, it, there's, no, there's no pattern of injury that's going to blow you out there like when you lay your arm back this way. So it's in a controlled environment and it's going through movements that are less stressful than for example, the throwing movement, and then it's also going to build strength and mobility to where you'll better survive it over there. I mean, I think it's just something that it's hard to, like, get people to understand that until they've gone through it and they've experienced it. It's hard to, like, verbalize how the body adapts so much better here than just, in a, just throwing every day, you know? Now, give me an age, age limit. That's a good question because, you know, you go into Asia, you go into, you know, Eastern Europe, and they're doing this at five years old, um, obviously supervised, right? Um, and, and I did a study or I did an article. I looked at every developmental organization in the country and w what they said about strength training for young kids or Olympic lifting young kids, and they all supported it because the studies were showing it was as beneficial or more beneficial for a child than it was for an adult to do the lifting. Now, here's the thing with it. When you're young, it's, the, the weight doesn't have a lot to do with it. It, it isn't even that effective because your, your muscles aren't really ready to grow when you're young and, and hypertrophy. But what it's great for is the central nervous system. It's teaching coordination. It's giving, it is giving stability and you know, good overall function. But more importantly, it's teaching the central nervous system how to move better, move more efficiently. Because you know when your kids, you're, like your boy, falls around, he falls down a lot, right? Because the central nervous system isn't advanced enough to keep his body protected all the time. And they've studies have shown lifting at a young age helps them mature that quicker. And all the old school stuff of it stunning your growth and all that is really just myths. I mean, there's a, there's a funny joke where the, the Olympic lifter, Matt Bruce, who advises me on this, he, he always tells people he's short because the Olympic lifts. And it's really the other way around. It's just like gymnastics. Why do the tall girls fall out of gymnastics because it's harder for them to do the moves than the little girls. It's like, you know, you're, you're, an upper, you're a lifter. Who, who, ha, who has a harder time, the guy with the long arms or the short arms, right? So obviously, if in the sport of bench pressing, the short guys, the short arms are always going to win. Uh, and it's, and it's kind of like here, the, the smaller people are going to be weed out, weeded out. So when we see all these Olympic lifters and these little bitty guys, it's not because the sport made them little or the gymnastics made them little. It, because it's just the fact that they, as the pyramid went up, those are the ones that survived the sport because of the, they had the advantage of being smaller. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, in your program, do you go through all of, like, if someone was to purchase it online, are they going to get a full uh, tutorial on how to do this, uh, all the lifts, everything that you go through? Do you tell them to go seek someone out in person? How does that work? So we, it, when you get my program, you get a bunch of different levels of it, and it has... Um, I, I, threw, I threw videos in there from a long time ago of Chad Englehart. He's the head strength coach for the Washington Redskins. He'll teach you them in, in there. I threw Coach Hatch's videos in there. He's the Olympic lifting coach. He'll teach them to you in there. You got me teaching them. So we have three instructors that are well-known teaching you the Olympic lifts in there. And at the same time, too, I do advise you to find a USA weightlifting coach in your area. They're not hard to find. And, and then it comes with the programming, like how much weight am I doing? How many steps, sets on what day? And what period, meaning like some weeks are going to be lighter than other weeks. So all that is laid out through levels with all the instructional videos to really understand it. And is it safe to say that it's a, even though you're going to a, a USA weightlifting coach, the programming is different because their goal is to lift as much weight as they can. Your goal is to throw a baseball as fast as you can. Yeah, it is different. Like we're, we're not snatching. 
we're not doing full cleans, we're just doing power cleans because all I care about is a triple extension, how much power can I get through my lower half, and then it's balancing with my throws. It's, so you're right, it, our programming would be more specific to the throwing athlete than if you're in Olympic lifting school, their programming is gonna be more specific to the Olympic lifter. Now also too, you're gonna have different methods of coaching Olympic lifting. You have catapulters or, or guys that like to hinge and, and use their backs and upper body and then you'll have triple extenders that like to jump the bars. Ideally, this is gonna work better with those that teach more triple extension, so. Gotcha, well that's great. That's Pat for you right there, and we actually made a video with four tips, Pat being one of them, three more great ones that you're gonna to wanna to see, and we wanna give you that video for free. All you gotta do is click the first link in the description down below. It's gonna take you to a page, you enter your first name and your email, and we'll shoot you that video over right away. Uh, really, really good stuff in that video, so definitely check it out, uh, and let us know how much you love it, because it's gonna help you. But <laughs> this video right here, we're gonna talk about pitching velocity leaks, where guys are leaking their velocity, and we're gonna make this a little bit fun. We're gonna have a competition. I'm gonna give you one leak, He's going to give you one leak. We haven't talked about this. We don't even know what we're going to talk about. We're right, just right. kind of <laughs> freestyling right now. But uh, in all seriousness, <laughs> this is going to be some good stuff.